Grassroots series. In this video, we will be exploring the art of empathy and uh, going a little bit deep into it, which is going to be critical for the growth and the scale of your businesses. So a bit about me before we start. My name's Jane and I run a business called Kiros Now. That word means the opportune moment in time. And my belief and my passion is that talking to real people and understanding those needs is critical. And to build empathy in that way makes, means that we can make great things happen. So let's start. Firstly, what are you gonna to learn today in this video? In terms of the art of empathy, um, we're going to cover off and share with you the importance of empathy, why you should do it, what is it, and why understanding your customer needs is so important. We're then going to share how to build empathy. So just one of the tools and techniques which is absolutely critical in building emotional empathy so you really understand your customer needs. And then a small section on embedding empathy. So what are the key things you can do from those learnings of when you talk to people and build empathy? What could that mean for your business as you look forward? So I say it's an art because it's not something I can give you a checklist to do. Sure, there's some stuff I can share with you, but really it's about how you approach it. And a lot of it is about you yourself and what you're willing to listen to and learn. And so that's going to be really critical as you're starting your business, building it, scaling it, maybe changing your products and going into new markets. The customer is the expert. And I want to share with you how you can understand that and how you can build with the customer beside you. So let's think about the importance of empathy. So this is really empathy will, in a way, question your own reality. But that's a good thing because this deep understanding of customers will mean that your business and the value proposition that your business delivers is going to be what your customers want what they need and perhaps not even what they might see they need today, but they will understand it once it's in front of them. So I ask you to question your reality as we go into this section. So firstly, what is empathy? And I know if I was able to talk to you uh, in real life, pretty well everyone would say it's standing in people's shoes. And that's very true. But there's two levels of empathy I want you to think about. One is cognitive empathy. And this is where you're taking the perspective. So you really, you're putting yourself in a person's shoes and you believe you know the next action that they will take. Or you, un, you have their perspective, I guess, on the world that you're creating with your new business. So the other empathy is emotional empathy. And this is where it's really around tapping into feelings and in a way you've sort of caught their emotions and you understand and feel your customers emotions and this is important because it is you it will help you to understand why people do what they do not just what they do and this means that your business can anticipate and build things for the why that your customers hold and there's many great reasons to do that. The other thing about empathy is that often when you know you may have an idea and your business may have products and services now and they may have come from ideas that you've already got now but before you take another step forward empathy is about taking a step back and really thinking about the problem that you're solving and who cares who cares about that problem to take on what you're offering to them so often with empathy, we use the analogy of an iceberg. You've probably used it for other things as well. But it is about, like an iceberg, there's so much under the water, which is why there's a lot of learnings in empathy because often it doesn't come naturally. Above the water, what you'll see are opinions and facts, generalizations and behaviors, things that are very easy to see. But what's missing if you don't build empathy is understanding the reasoning and the values and the beliefs of your customers. 
And this is really important. If you want them to use what you're delivering to the market and for it to be a winner, then you've got to get below the surface. And that's hard because a lot of our values and beliefs, they, they're stored in the most primitive area of our brain, you know, and we don't have a language for that. So empathy is about exploring those values and beliefs through storytelling. And from that, as you go deeper, you really, really understand why people do what they do. So empathy is about going deep as well. But why is empathy so important? Why are we having this module? And there's some pretty, there's some great evidence where the lack of empathy has been detrimental for businesses. In fact, over 70% of startup companies usually fail within 20 months of the first raising of finance or even earlier. And there's lots of examples you may have heard from your, your colleagues and other business people. But essentially, if you don't build empathy for your customers, get under the water and really understand why they do what they do and what is the value proposition they're looking for, then essentially you have no customers. If you have no customers, you have no market and no one cares. So absolutely key for you to move forward and to grow and to survive. The other reason why you really need empathy, which falls into part of this to grow and survive, is this sort of nine times effect. You need to understand what could be 10 times better than what the market offers today. And the reason for that is that typically consumers or customers overweight what they're doing today by about a factor of three. And companies and businesses like yourself, you really believe and you overweight your product's benefits probably by about three times as well. So empathy allows us to really understand what will help the customer change the behaviours they're doing today in terms of addressing their needs and buying the products and services that businesses offer. So empathy is really important for your success. And with empathy, you will then really focus on what matters to them. And that's the absolute core of any successful business. You've probably been looking at your business model canvas or if you haven't, you, you probably have it right beside you. Of course, part of that is the value proposition that you're offering. Everything in the business model is around the customer and the value proposition. Remember, the, you, the value proposition is what you're proposing. It's only a value if your customer picks it up and takes it. So empathy focuses on that customer canvas, that circle of the value proposition canvas. You really get to know what they're trying to achieve. You really understand and feel their emotions of their pains and their aspirations. Where do they want to go? If you can tap into those aspirations through your learning of empathy, that's where the magic is. And that's where a lot of businesses don't go. They just fix pains. So empathy is really important. And if you do this, you're really going to create a different business model. Typically business models, you know, there's a, sometimes there's a big push to get it out there. The promotion that you have to do, the channels, the relationships that you have to build, they can take a long time. If you're successful in being empathetic, knowing who your customers are, what their latent needs are, then sometimes you create a pool business model. And that's fantastic because if people come up to you and say, you know what, I've actually been looking for that for years. I want that. Give it to me now. When is it ready? I've heard about this. How do I get it? That's an amazing place to be for a business, not just for your survival, but also to tap into an, an investment and other people that will support you along the way. This has happened to me once and um, it created, you know, some, an amazing experience where we had to make sure we were ready once we, we developed the product. 
So that's what is and why. And I want to share with you a little story just to illustrate that. It's actually a project that I was involved in in 2008. And it was to do with quad bike safety on farms. So you may be quite familiar with um, quad bike safety, but for those that aren't, a lot of people die while they're operating their quad bikes on farms. And quad bikes are an essential piece of equipment to enable those farms to operate every day and to operate efficiently. Now in 2016, sorry, 2018, there was actually seven fatalities on the, quad, on the farms and many more injuries. Now, as a result of that, our government and a lot of other organisations, regulators and suppliers got together to think about what do we need to do? We need to fix this problem. And they, they really looked at what they could do. And their focus was around making them safer through design. So, you know, really looking at the bike and what would make it more stable and also increasing the personal protection equipment that's available and training. And those were the key focus areas, very functional and very logical. And that may be part of your business that your value proposition is very logical to you. We were really lucky that they, they didn't just stop there. They didn't just think about great technology and training will save lives. That group or that organization and consortium realized that by building empathy with the people that use quad bikes is also going to be critical and complement the success of the, of the program. So this is where empathy can really make a difference. And I want to introduce you to Reg. And we'll see Reg throughout the whole time of this video. Reg is a third generational farmer. He runs many cattle on very large land. He has five quad bikes which you know, his children use as well as workers and, his, and his, the rest of his family. Reg is a really proud man and he has built, he has kept this farm and looked after it since he was given it from his father. And he knows his land. He loves his land. He loves being on the farm. And so he has a lot of experience and expertise. And in fact, when we spoke to him, these things really came out as we were building empathy and, you know, he, he would tell us the best thing of the day is I get up in the morning and I get a cup of tea and I go out and I look at my land and it's quiet and it's crisp and I know everything there. There was so much joy and love for his land and family, which is what we find by talking to people. He doesn't think he's the one at risk. He has a huge amount of experience on quad bikes. So probably never wouldn't, would take up this new equipment because it's not needed in his mind. His experience is not, doesn't need to be improved through additional equipment. He's never had what was being called an incident. He's had a few near misses, but not an incident. So these are very different things that we found out, which would really complement how we roll out that technology. And it meant that we were looking at great technology that saves lives and empathy to understand how to build a safety culture, which would mean that technology would be adopted. So I ask you, what is the value proposition that you're offering today? Is it logical and functional? Or is it tapping into hopes and dreams and aspirations? That's where you need to be. And that's how you can be successful. So when do you do, when, how, when should you build empathy? The answer is really quite simple, all the time. Always talk to people, always understand what's going on. Never miss an opportunity to hear what people think. Of course, the next question comes up is, how? How do you do this thing? How can I adopt an empathetic approach to really build and build on the success of my business? And there's five quick ways that I'm just going to go through with you now. And I'm going to go into a couple of them a bit deeper. But essentially, the first thing is you've got to identify the roles that you need to understand in terms of your stakeholders and customer segments. Now, it's, there's many roles 
And we're just going to touch on users, choosers and payers. This is a really good place to start. When you think about a user being the end person, which is Reg, who's going to use our, our quad bike. Choosers, these are the people that will influence, refer or even buy your product or service. And they may be different to users or they may be the same. And funders or payers. Who would be paying? Again, it might be the same person, but with a lot of products and services, someone else may pay for it. For example, with Reg, the government was providing subsidies for that equipment to be purchased. So there was a part payment by government. So we had to get close to them as well and really understand them. So think about who is your customer. Even with Lego, it's different. Your chooser might be the parent, um, your user might be the child, the payer might be the parent or perhaps someone that's a collector. But there's different motivations and that's what empathy understands you, uh, will help you to understand. The child just wants to be colours, fun, maybe my latest movie. The parent, safe, you know, cost, cost effective, very different things even in this simple example. So think about the roles that you need to get close to, particularly with those three roles. The second thing is once you've worked out the types of people you need to talk to, know who, so who are the exact people. Now, generally with any of those roles, you'll have a normal curve, a bell curve of the people that will fit in there. And often it's easier for us to talk to people that you know, are pretty standard customers. I encourage you and to really develop empathy and understand a lot more is speak to the extreme users, the people that are really happy and they love the type of thing that you're going to bring or they love the situation that you're innovating in and the people that are really annoyed with what's going on and they, they're not listening and they, they don't want to hear anything because no one can fix it they may actually have a fix that they've already tried, which if you understood what they were doing, it would help to understand if your product and service was going to deliver that. These two extremes will tell you exactly what they think. And sometimes they're the easiest people to get great information out of and really get close to and build empathy with. So think about the customer continuum. The third thing, which I'll go into deeper in the next section is listening conversations. You've got to talk to real people to build empathy. Your family, your friends, people that know you are not the right people to understand if your business is going to grow. You've got to talk to your customers and they may be strangers and they're not going to be in your building. You need to deeply understand their world. And we're going to go through that. I'm going to give you some tips in how to run what I call listening conversations. Absolutely critical. Don't let anything go before you do that. By doing listening conversations, you're going to go deep under the water. Remember, that's where we want to go with the iceberg. Sure, you can run a quantitative survey. You know, lots of people are like, let's do a survey monkey. Let's get an email out there. You're not going to build empathy with that. Um, you need to, to run these one-on-one -on -one interviews or listening conversations or focus group. These will complement your surveys, your shadowing, your diaries, and the other things that you use. But they are how you get to deeply understand and build emotional empathy, which will really help with your product design and growth and where you go next. Once you've done that, you build empathy and you build on that by finding patterns. And this is what we call making sense of your data and finding insights. Where could you be unique? What is not being fixed now? What is not being provided to help them reach their dreams? Finding patterns is really personal. It's really human. And that's what your business will be about. It's actually building benefits for humans. So you've got to understand and make sense of that data. And the fourth thing, which often people forget, they go, oh, well, go out and do some interviews. But the biggest thing is you. You need to be self-aware. You need to understand what is important and what matters. And you know what? It might not be what you think. It might, 
seem pretty crazy to you. But you must hold your assumptions and biases lightly around the context of your business. Your customers are the experts. And if you're not self-aware, you won't hear. And in one project, actually in the project with Reg, um, we went and did lots of interviews. And I love interviews because you listen to conversations, you learn so much. Came back for the debrief and I said to one of the team members, so what did you learn? Because I'm always learning stuff. And uh, she said nothing. And I went, oh, that's really strange. She goes, yeah, they were wrong. Customers are not wrong. You make them part of your team. And if you don't, you won't really know if you're solving a problem for the market. You won't really know if customers care. So you need to be self-aware and you need to think how you will respond if you hear something that perhaps is not aligned with your beliefs. Think about your role as an entrepreneur and the idea of delivering benefit and outcome for your customer. How do you do that? You build empathy. So if you do all this and building empathy, what you will do is to be able to create exciting value propositions for them. It's not for you, it's for them. So, you know, and this of course is part of the customer canvas and we can work that out by analyzing our data. So if we even just to simply look at coffee, you know, and coffee has been a big thing in the entrepreneur world and new businesses with Nespresso and it's often used as an example. Its value proposition is not to make coffee. Its value proposition is many things. It's, it's you know, to actually savour the taste of good coffee at home or to give me a reward at that three o'clock slump. So think about what is your value proposition. For Reg, the value proposition wasn't about being offered safer design, increased PPE or training. That was how it was done. His value proposition was really helping him to make safety decisions in the moment. And we only found that out by talking to him and building uh, emotional empathy for people like Reg. So just to cap up this first little section, empathy helps you to understand your customers. Don't be broken, stay alive, be successful. You're all gonna deliver great things and empathy will help you to get there. Empathy will show you, will enable you to tap into the values and beliefs of your customers and why they do what they do now. Try to catch their emotions. Like, you know, like something that you gather up as you're listening to them. If you do that, you're more likely to really solve the problem and potentially offer something that is 10 times better than what they have today. And that's what empathy will do. We went through five little steps, but essentially where this is going to get you is Ultimately, how fantastic if you had a pool business model and people came to you. Empathy will get you there. Knowing your customers will get you there. If you don't have customers, you don't have a market and no one will care. So that's the first bit of the um, art of empathy. The second bit, and I mentioned this in that five steps of how do you build empathy. I want to talk about the listening conversations. These are a critical part of building empathy and often not done well or felt to be too hard. You, as I mentioned, you want to talk to real people, those customers that or potential customers in the context of your business. They may be non-customers now, but with your product and service, they may be your most avid customer ever. And this use of listening conversations well will help you to move from your bias and assumptions to fact so that you can really create value propositions that exist and that people want. So listening conversations are a little bit from the traditional interview. You know, you often think of, oh, I'll go out and do interviews. You may have done some interviews now and you probably have. So hopefully this, this information might build on what you already know. But a listening conversation is a semi-structured conversation where there is no right or wrong. 
And while you have a question guide and you know where you want to go, you actually respond to what you hear from the customer. You listen more than you talk. And you want to get those stories out because remember, values uh, and guiding principles don't have their own language. We've got to tip our customers into telling us stories so that we can really understand why they did something, what was behind it. So it's conversational. So how do we do this? Firstly, we've got to look at the types of questions that you've got to build. I call them powerful questions. And these, you know, you'll use to test your assumptions. There's three elements of powerful questions that are absolutely key. The structure, the scope, and whether they contain your own assumptions. So the structure, and you've probably heard of opened and closed questions. The most open questions are more powerful. Why is the most uh, powerful question? Why did you do that? However, using why all the time can be very annoying for people and it will move you out of that conversational space. It'll move you into more of a check, checkbook um, interview. So I always say to people, take TED along with you. TED is an acronym for, hey, tell me more about that. E, explain to me why you did that. Soften the why. Describe to me how that felt. So TED is a great way to get under the water and get those stories going. So structure, scope. I call this the Goldilocks principle. Questions can be way, way too big where it's like, uh, I'm not gonna get any, I don't really know what you're asking. I don't have an opinion on this. I actually don't have any, I don't really care. Or they may be too small, which is perhaps where you're actually asking for specific information about what you believe or your assumptions. And of course, we're looking for the just right. So you could ask, are your quad bikes safe in terms of reg? That's probably too small. What do you think Australia needs to do to increase safety for quad bikes? Probably too big to ask a farmer. Where we found the most information and understanding was tell me about your experience with quad bikes on your farm. So many stories came out of that. The third thing is to think about, have you got assumptions in your questions? When you deliver them, are you saying something that automatically shows what you think? So if you can ask, what is wrong with quad bikes today? Quad bikes are unsafe, tell me more about that. We're really putting our assumptions in there. And to do really great listening conversations, you need questions that are non-judgmental. So, what are the possibilities for quad bikes on your farm? How could they be used differently? Let's look at how you deliver it. So you have a set of questions. You've thought about the intent of the interview and you're reaching out to specific people. So just be sure of that intent. Why are you talking to them? Don't waste their time. Don't waste your time. Make sure it's valuable for both of you. So then I ask you to use the questioning funnel as a structure. Firstly, you ask very wide, but still, you know, well-structured questions with the Goldilocks just right principle about their world. This will help you to build rapport. Then you could go a little bit into the theme. So for example, we could ask about their farm and what's the day-to-day. -day. Then we could ask about the, you know, how they use equipment on their farm. And, and then at the end in our world, what about quad bikes? You know, what are the things that you use? If you do this really well, you actually, and you're listening, you don't move much past one. You might go to two, but they're telling you what they think and you're listening and you're moving with them. It's like a dance. As I mentioned, if you do it well, they'll tell stories and that's like the tipping point that you want to achieve. Once they feel comfortable with you and you've given up a little bit of yourself, they will move into stories and that's where you learn some great stuff. So some examples of types of questions in their world, what's a typical day or experience? What is important to you in the context of your business? When you say, as you're listening to them, the love, you love your farm, what do you mean by that? So that example of that story with a cup of tea and surveying the land came out of these types of questions. 
then when you go into the theme, you can call back some of the things that you heard and apply them to what you we want to know a little bit more. You mentioned you um, run maintenance on all your equipment. Tell me more about that. Is it all equipment? Is it regular? Is it reactive? Tell me about the last time. These are really, really good question because people, if they often they just want to, you know, be kind to you and say, yes, of course, I'm always safe on my quad bike. So tell me about the last time you specifically did something differently to be safer on your quad bike. If they go, oh, I don't really remember, then they're not really potentially sharing the real world with you. However, they may say, well, last week I did la la la. And if they said that, then you get more information about what they actually do. Another great, my, another great question is, you know, what, what were you thinking or what was going through your mind when you did this or when this happened? Again, in the context of your business and your value proposition that you're hoping to achieve. In terms of your world, you know, what is important to you in terms of this uh, theme? How do you choose between different scenarios? And then you could also get some quantitative data, how many quad bikes they've got, how often they ride them, how often they maintain them, who rides them. So this is a great way to structure your listening conversation. Key is when you end a conversation like this is to finish with three questions. Is there anything else you'd like to share that I haven't asked? Is there anyone else that might be interested in talking to me? Great way to expand your network of customers that you're listening to. And would you like me to keep you update, update on how I progress? Great way to be able to come back in potentially when you've got a prototype or you've got something that you want to test. So do remember that. The key thing when you go into listening conversations is you don't talk about your solution at all. You would position yourself higher than the solution. For example, we didn't go in and say, we want to talk about how to make quad bikes safer. What we did to set the scene and to recruit for the listening conversations was, we've got some ideas on how to increase safety in farms. Would you be interested in, in sharing your knowledge with us? So keep it high. So tips for interview questions, childlike curiosity, love it, enjoy it, listen to it. Don't sell is really important. This is not a time for selling. This is a time for understanding. Avoid speculation. Don't think about the future. People don't know what they'll do in the future. It depends is really the answer because it depends on what's happening at the time and their values and guiding principles. Do get facts and explore the past. As I mentioned before, when was the last time? Can you tell me about a time when you did something or when this happened? Ask about problems. What was going through your mind? Tell me about how you resolve this. How did that affect you? What, you know, what happened as a result? Again, that curiosity is absolutely key. So if we think about listening conversations as a key tool that you need to take on to build empathy, then this is where you can test your riskiest assumptions. As I mentioned before, you need to hold your assumptions and biases lightly and understand whether they're true or whether they're something that you really need to think about differently. Listening conversations are the way to do it. The earlier you look at your riskiest assumptions, the better because you don't want to come to the end of a market launch or anything like that and then realise that no one cares. When it could have taken just a little tweak, maybe a change in wording or even equipment, and you could have really nailed it. So listening conversations will help you with that. Think about your questions that you will deliver and how you will deliver it and be curious and learn. So the third thing in the art of empathy that you're going to learn today that I wanted to share with you was how do we embed it in your everyday business? Whether you're in the searching phase, the design and development phase or the launching phase, the empathy and the understanding that you've built from these listening conversations and the way that you're interacting with your customers can be used in a way 
that will help you progress with your customer. And in a way, they become part of, their or part of your team. So a couple of frameworks that I wanted to share with you um, where we're really putting empathy in action. And it's very powerful. It may seem simple, but it's a really good reminder that it's not about you, that it is for your customer. And without customers, no one cares. So there's various ways that you can analyze what you hear in listening conversations. And I would recommend that you audio record your listening conversations so that you can really focus on what you're hearing because you're doing that dance and where you're following and listening to their stories. So based on that recording that you have, you can analyze and find patterns and move from the data and maybe even pivot what you're doing early in design and development. One of the tools that we use a lot is um, empathy mapping. And this is used by people that are new to listening conversations and empathy. Once you use it a couple of times, it will, be, it will come very naturally. But essentially think about what you heard in four different ways. What did you hear they actually said? The quotes and the different words that they used. Uh, for example, with Reg, he never spoke about incidents. So from the design team, incidents were when people came off a quad bike and were severely injured. Reg spoke about near misses. Yeah, he came off his motorbike quite a few times. And actually, one of the customers we interviewed had quite a few scars from quad bike injuries, but they were near misses. So that terminology became a key tipping point in what we were building because it meant we could really talk to our customers and the farmers in the same language and their language is important not ours. Also think about what they're doing, what do you see, what were they doing when they were riding the bike. I had to get on very quickly to save a calf in the middle of the night. I didn't have time to put on a helmet. I had to get out there. So things like that, they're very easy to understand and very easy to see and hear. They're very explicit. The other four, two things you want to think about when you're looking at your interview data is what were they thinking? What were they feeling? So often you'll infer these from nonverbal cues. You might see a change in their face. You might see a change in the way that they're sitting. Or they might be quite open with you, particularly if you've got good questions about how they were feeling at the time. This is gold on the right hand side. If you can really understand their thoughts and their beliefs and their feelings, that's emotional empathy. And that will take you a long way. Often when I work with businesses, the first thing when we come back from those initial interviews or listening conversations, everything's on the left hand side. And that's because they haven't gone deep enough. They haven't used TED. They haven't really thought about listening rather than talking. They're often pitching an idea or a solution rather than understanding why people do what they do. So a great little tool. This helps us to reframe the problem knowing this. And so it's like peeling back an onion and you're sort of peeling back and asking those TED questions to understand more and more. I'm just really curious. Can you tell me more about that? And so that takes a lot. And, but it's great when you get there. And you'll often find that the value will come out the deeper you go. This other image is a bit of a value tree. And you'll see it's a bit like Maslow's hierarchy. Where we've got the real functional things at the bottom. And as we go up, we transcend into bigger and more important needs. So think about if you're really delivering a value proposition that is built with an empathetic approach, you're going to be at least at that emotional stage. Functional, everyone expects that, that's table stakes. Your business needs to be more than that. What you will find though, when you're reframing the problem like this and understanding what really matters is often there's gonna be tension. There'll be tension about what is already existing in the market and what they want and what their latent needs are. This is really bringing out your knowledge of empathy so if we think about Reg, when we were talking to him, we really found this key tension. Uh, one of the um, planned solutions was training, training on how to ride safer. And that's done really well with the government agencies. What we discovered is that Reg felt insulted at the moment 
because he's experienced rider, you know, and the trainers just tell him what they reckon he's doing wrong. I'm not going to go to that training. So that really meant that we had a tension there with what the potential solution was and how Reg would have interacted with it. And the tension was around that lack of respect for his existing knowledge and experience. Now, it, that lack of respect wasn't really there from the trainers. They had huge respect, but that's what Reg felt and that's what came out in the stories. So for us, and this is one little example, the real problem was to solve was how do we share safer writing skills, even with the experts that take risks? And that sharing could have involved Reg. So think about the tension and you'll get there if you've really built great empathy. And that's where you can make a difference and where your product and service will be grabbed because you're tapping into something that they really feel. Another tool is personas. And you may have already been exposed to personas. They're very widely used today. They're archetypes. They're groups of people that are associated and connected by motivations. These, if you build personas really well, these are the people that are going to help you cross the chasm to, to really launch into the early majority of the market and build your business and grow and scale. It's just not enough to have the early adopters. You know, those people probably like you and I, where it's like, oh, there's a new shiny thing. I want to try it. You want the people that will stay and are the majority that's how to build a good business. And if you've got personas, this can really help you. And I've seen this used in many companies. So personas are not just demographic. They really help you to understand what makes people tick, how they see themselves, and how they would interact with your product or service. The key thing is to understand from your listening conversations when you analyze the data, really start to think about what are the motivations and mindsets that are happening here and who are connected by those mindsets. So you can see here, there's a couple of mindsets that we really looked at. Um, and so it didn't really matter if they had cattle or sheep or, or an orchard often, you know, it, those demographics didn't really matter. It was what was going on, why they did things that they do. And so from that, we could build this persona. It's creative, it is human, it's really humanizing some of the product and service, the outcomes that you're hoping to achieve. And you'll see that where we had these motivations, they became part of Reg. So we really understood who he was. He was risk savvy after an incident, considered himself an expert writer. He's trusted advisors were mainly the associations around him, like the Country Women's Association, the Farmers Co-op. The government was there to provide governance. Those other associations there were to look after Reg and make sure he did the right things. Really powerful, really powerful are personas. And I've seen development teams go, oh, do you think Reg needs that? It's like, no, actually, he doesn't. We've got to get to market. We've got to get to market in a time frame. It's not top of his list. We want to really solve the needs that he has today. And let's, let's put it on the list. So you probably have three to five personas. They may be different roles. Remember the users, choosers and payers, different sets of personas. And then think about, you know, what is the importance? For us, Reg was the persona that would give us the biggest bang for our buck. And that's what you've got to think about. What should I put my effort in? And these are the things, you know, what will you teach me that I don't already know? So, so critical. So a lot of people use personas, this, you know, this worksheets that I have, if you want to reach out, please do. It's uh, creative and it's really valuable. Some uh, customers that I know actually take them to meetings when they're very happy with someone like Reg they actually build a life-size cutout and Reg will go to meetings just to remind the team about who the value proposition is for. Personas also become very important when you're pitching for funding because it humanizes what you do and people really associate with why people like Reg would want what you're doing. So it becomes more human. 
The last thing I want to mention is journey maps, which are built from personas. So they are a day in the life or, you know, an, an outcome that's achieved by that persona. So uh, it really shows you what they're going through. So in our case, you know, it was about Reg from when he, he bought, used, and maybe got another quad bike and what happened in that time. So detail is absolutely important. They can be really long, but it's the detail that will show you um, what is going on and where you can tap into making a difference with your product or service. It helps you to map what people had trouble articulating because you've got the feelings in there. So you're listing what they're, what they're doing, what they're saying and thinking, what they're feeling and the type of emotion. Solving something and innovating to get rid of anger or frustration are actually two very different solutions. So you need to think about what are the emotions that your customers have at the moment? Remember that emotional empathy we mentioned? Absolutely critical. So they can be really long, you know, often, you know, this is where, you know, post-its might come in so that you can map it and move it around. And with your team, from your learnings of your listening conversations, really put down what are the key things we need to focus on? What are the key pains that we need to get rid of? Where can we make something even better than it is today? Because innovation and new businesses and value propositions are not just about getting rid of pains. They're also about enabling aspirations. And as I mentioned before, that's often what people forget about. So journey maps are done for each of your personas. And the great thing that comes out of this, when you step back and you look at it and you go, ah, this is what we need to focus on. You can start to build a design brief or guiding principles for your business. This is an example which is used a lot, but it's a great example that can show you what you can do. So you can see we've got a journey map. We've got guiding principles that have come out of our learnings from, from listening conversations and also highlighting opportunities. These types of summaries are really helpful for all the teams within a business. It might be the design team to remind them what are our guiding principles. It might be the launch team about what are our guiding principles? Why are we doing this? Who are we launching to? So think about what is possible once you know that detail and it's, it's embedded with empathy and touch it up with some logical and some functional things that you can develop. So in terms of embedding empathy, I ask you to take it for a test drive. These are tools and frameworks that have taken you from those listening conversations, the empathy that you're building every day, and they're putting into actionable assets that you can share in many different formats. So I do encourage you to build on those. Of course, when you're doing it, you want to make sure that you're just not um, falling into what you think and your assumptions. Those tools are written by Reg, not by you. So this is an example of what we found, you know, when we were working with Reg and we did the journey maps, you know, so many different things that were tied up into how the functional, the design of the equipment, the PPE and the training, how that needed to be presented. And it created very different prototypes for us that we then went on to test that engaged with what was happening in the moment. What was the long-term success of the farm? What was the love and, and the importance of family and land and, you know, um, heritage was all there? And who was trusted? Not who we assumed was trusted, but who was really trusted and how could we make things happen? So use these frameworks to learn and generate insights further from your listening conversations. Really go deeper than the data in your listening conversations. There's so much value there. Just embed empathy in your organization every day. Check out, like look for that tension. When you find that tension, that is the aha moment and that's where you can make a difference. These are the insights that really create patterns and of mindsets and willingness to do something different. 
It's the why people do what they do. Remember the intrinsic, the right-hand side of that empathy map. And of course, these assets can be used. They can actually become part of your team. You know, the persona can be part of your team and they can help you in making decisions uh, in an objective way as you build and really improve and enrich your products and services as you go. So over the last little bit of time, we've really looked at the art of empathy. And I think you'll see that there's some tools and techniques that I've shared with you, but you've got to go out and try it. And it's not always easy the first time. And you've just got to start giving it a go and really talk to people. Don't pitch, be curious, really understand why they do what they do. Build emotional empathy. And then, you know, think about what you can do with it. So empathy is absolutely critical. The successful businesses are people powered businesses. And those people are customers and their latent needs. They look at what you propose for value and they go, that is of great value to me. You will not find that out without making the effort to build empathy. Don't be a broken business, be a people powered successful business. Go out of your comfort zone and listen to what people wanna say and the stories that they tell. Thank you, I really enjoyed sharing, obviously something that I'm really passionate about. If you would like to know more, or if you want any of the, the tools and frameworks on listening conversations, personas, journey maps, just reach out to me. I'd be very happy to share them with you. Thank you.